Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Lifton, the president of Rockefeller University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to another of our sessions, virtual discussions with genuine experts. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, a terrific group of scientists in 23 Rockefeller laboratories rapidly launched vital research projects on COVID-19, often in collaboration with colleagues around the world. Today's virtual discussion is with one of those scientists, Paul Benash, whose research has transformed our understanding of viruses and their interactions with human hosts. Before Paul begins to discuss his research on COVID-19, I'll give you an update on some of what's happened in the epidemic over the last two weeks. So this is the coronavirus, uh, which we've all come to know. Uh, it's a single-stranded RNA, positive strand RNA virus uh, that encodes all of the proteins encoded uh, for the life cycle of the virus. So this is where we stood uh, a month ago with the global pandemic from the Johns Hopkins uh, website. And in the upper left corner, you can see that at that time, there were 5 million cases in the world and uh, 328,000 deaths worldwide. And over the last month, that number has increased by more than 3 million people who have been newly infected since that time. <clears throat> and the number of deaths has increased to uh, uh, nearly 450,000 uh, worldwide. Uh, so clearly uh, there is uh, a continued spread of the virus uh, globally. And in the lower right-hand corner, you can see on a daily basis, how many new cases have been diagnosed uh, uh, worldwide. And that number has increased uh, from a month ago uh, of about 100,000 uh, to now nearly 150,000 uh, per day. And this slide shows that th there are several hotspots uh, around the world currently. Uh, and these are largely focused uh, in South and Central America uh, and in Southern India and uh, parts of the Middle East. So uh, these slides show the individual daily diagnosis of new cases in uh, Brazil, which is uh, currently the world's uh, highest contributor to the daily case total with about 30,000 new cases uh, per day. Uh, but also Chile and Mexico show uh, continuing growth in the number of daily cases diagnosed. And this is also happening in uh, India, uh, one of the largest countries uh, in the world that now has more than 10,000 cases daily uh, and continuing to go up. Uh, and Bangladesh and Saudi Arabia are also good examples of countries uh, in which the rate of new infection continues to increase. In contrast, next slide, there are other countries in which the rate of infection has drastically diminished uh, and uh, is closing in on being uh, uh, not exterminated, but uh, very low levels of daily infection. Uh, and this provides, uh, I think, hope for the ability to extinguish the virus uh, if uh, good care is taken. And as you know, China began with uh, uh, the virus and had the devastating early infection uh, but has since largely gained control of the virus uh, with the exception of a recent uh, recurrence in Beijing that they're working on right now. Uh, but they have shown good ability to control the virus uh, by identifying cases, putting them in strict isolation, doing contact tracing and preventing the spread of uh, virus from individuals. Similar paths have been taken in Japan and South Korea in Asia. These aren't the only parts of the world in which uh, uh, the virus has uh, uh, substantially stopped spreading. Uh, Italy, Germany, and Switzerland in Europe also, uh, despite having a, a very substantial uh, and in some cases uh, extraordinary outbreaks of the virus as in Italy, uh, now have drastically lower incidence of uh, a new infection occurring uh, as do many other countries uh, in Europe and uh, other parts of the, of the world, uh, Australia and New Zealand being other examples of countries who saw the virus coming, were well prepared, did not, not allow it to gain a foothold and never actually had a very large outbreak so whatsoever. So I think the importance of this is uh, the virus can be controlled, but it requires uh, considerable effort on the part of government and uh, local populations to enable that to occur. This not only, uh, uh, next slide shows other countries in which uh, the spread of virus has not been controlled and in fact has stayed relatively uh, constant in general over time. Uh, Russia is a good example where they've been clocking about 8,000 new cases per day for the last month. 
Uh, Sweden, which has not taken the same uh, control efforts that uh, much of the rest of Europe has, uh, has gone from having a stable number of about 500 cases a month to now over a thousand uh, a day to over a thousand cases a day uh, in recent weeks. Iran shows a recrudescence of infection. And at the bottom panel, we see the uh, overall case rate in the United States which distressingly remains above 20,000 cases per day uh, diagnosed on average. Uh, and we are clearly not as a country uh, tamping down the uh, infection rate as a country. That doesn't mean that we're not making progress uh, in uh, some localities. This shows uh, uh, the contrasts uh, across states in the United States. I uh, see at the top panel uh, three states in which severe outbreaks in uh, New York, New Jersey, and, and uh, Michigan uh, have now been tamped down to uh, uh, much lower uh, incidence of uh, new infections occurring in each of uh, these states. In contrast, other states are going in the opposite direction, particularly as uh, these states are opening up uh, their economies. And uh, Arizona is a good example of uh, which is going from a uh, hundred cases, a, a few, few hundred cases a day uh, to in the last several days, over 2000 cases per day. Uh, Texas has had the uh, two worst cases days in their history in terms of new cases, uh, over 3000 in the last uh, several days. Florida is now showing uh, a drastic increase in uh, uh, new case rates as well. Some have suggested that this is attributable to increase in testing. Uh, were that the case, you would, ex you would not expect the rate of new hospitalizations to be going up. Uh, and that uh, turns out uh, uh, to be the case. This shows the total number of hospitalizations in Texas, showing that uh, uh, the total number is at an all-time high. And this is not just the cumulative effect. Uh, it is also attributable to new uh, hospitalizations per day. This shows the uh, rate of new hospitalizations in uh, the uh, Texas Medical Center uh, population, which is the largest hospital chain in, in Texas. Uh, centered in Houston, uh, and the light blue diamond and the darker blue diamond in the center of the slide show the opening of phase one of reopening of the economy in Texas uh, on May 1st and the opening of phase two on May 18th. And you can see that the state uh, since that time has gone from a rather low incidence of new hospitalizations to roughly tripling the number of new daily hospitalizations uh, in that state. So this makes clear that uh, there are serious problems in our control of the virus in some parts of the country. There are about 20 states in the United States uh, that have shown increasing uh, rates of new infection uh, as shown on the previous slide for a handful of these. In contrast to that, the state of New York uh, has uh, done, I think, uh, quite spectacularly well. This shows a slide from Governor Cuomo's presentation yesterday on New York City, uh, showing the total number of hospitalizations, which has come down from a peak of 12,000 to 761 uh, as of yesterday. These are hospitalizations for COVID-19. Uh, it's terrific progress. And uh, similarly, the number of daily deaths uh, from COVID-19 on a statewide basis has dropped uh, from a peak of uh, uh, nearly 800 uh, to uh, 22 as of yesterday. Uh, so this again, uh, is dramatic uh, improvement. Importantly, uh, the rate of uh, positive cases, the fraction of all uh, viral tests that have been positive have come down from a high of 57% of all tests being positive on April 1st, uh, down to 1.4% uh, as of yesterday. I note that uh, that rate has continued to come down uh, over the last uh, several weeks. Uh, following uh, the protests that began several weeks ago. We have not seen any evidence of a spike uh, resulting uh, from that, uh, nor from the reopening that occurred uh, in New York City on June 8th. And this simply shows the daily rates, uh, the daily percent of uh, all tests that are positive in each of the boroughs. And uh, you can see that over the last five days, they've continued to come down to extremely low levels, including in Manhattan, the uh, fraction of all tests that were positive uh, as of Tuesday uh, was one half of 1%, which uh, is an extremely uh, low rate of uh, uh, infection. 
So this is dramatic uh, uh, progress on the overall pandemic uh, in this city of, uh, in New York City, as well as in the state of New York. So I want to uh, switch now and just give a couple of updates on what's happened on uh, uh, the, the uh, therapeutics of uh, the virus. Uh, as you'll recall, hydroxychloroquine uh, was uh, touted as a potential therapeutic, uh, not based on a bad idea. It showed some act antiviral activity on uh, uh, cells being infected uh, in culture. Uh, but uh, the, uh, a randomized control trial in what uh, some, including me, might have thought was the best opportunity to show efficacy, uh, taking people who had been exposed to a person who was known to have been infected with the virus, uh, they had been exposed at a uh, short distance, less than six feet for more than 10 minutes while they were neither wearing a face mask nor an eye shield or were wearing a face mask but no eye shield. And these individuals were randomized to either a placebo or treatment uh, with hydroxychloroquine for five days. So there were 400 people in the hydroxychloroquine group and the placebo group. And uh, uh, after uh, a period of time, uh, the infection rate was compared in these two groups. And the bottom line was that there was no difference in the, uh, no significant difference in the rate of infection uh, in these two groups, providing no evidence from a randomized controlled trial that uh, giving hydroxychloroquine before people had signs and symptoms of infection, that you could prevent uh, the development of infection in these individuals. A second uh, trial that has not yet been published, but is part of a large clinical effort uh, run out of Oxford University uh, in uh, the United Kingdom, the recovery trial. Uh, so this has randomized a large number of individuals uh, through the severe pandemic that has uh, gone through uh, the UK uh, to either placebo or any of a number of potential therapies. One of these was hydroxychloroquine. And this uh, uh, study randomized 1,500 patients to receive hydroxychloroquine and 300 receiving uh, usual care, 3,000 receiving usual care. And after 28 days of treatment, 26% of those on hydroxychloroquine compared to 23.5% of those on usual care had died. No benefit to people who had received hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and this provides, uh, I think, uh, these two randomized studies together uh, provide compelling evidence that hydroxychloroquine uh, is unlikely to play a useful role in the therapeutics of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So in contrast, the same study, uh, a different arm of the study, had randomized uh, patients to receive dexamethasone, a portent, an important uh, glucocorticoid, an, an anti-inflammatory steroid drug uh, that is uh, used to uh, prevent inflammation in a variety of clinical settings. Uh, and dexamethasone is extremely potent. It's uh, about 50-fold uh, uh, more potent than uh, cortisol, which is the hormone that our bodies make every day. Uh, and the dosage is roughly uh, uh, 10 times the amount of uh, uh, cortisol equivalents, if you will, uh, than your body would normally make. So 2,000 patients received this uh, six milligram dose of dexamethasone once a day. Uh, 4,000 uh, received wow. usual care alone. Uh, patients, uh, were, uh, patients were enrolled in the study uh, as cases if they required supplemental oxygen and uh, were hospitalized. Uh, of patients who were actually the sickest, who were on a ventilator, uh, getting dexamethasone compared to usual care reduced death by a third <clears throat> from 41% fatality to 27% fatality. And the probability of this occurring uh, by chance alone was uh, less than one in a thousand. Similarly, <clears throat> patients who needed supplemental oxygen who were not on a ventilator, their death rate uh, 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 was uh, reduced by a fifth from 25% to 20%. And this was also uh, highly statistically significant, less than uh, one in 100. So uh, there is no benefit uh, and not to individuals not requiring uh, oxygen supplementation. So I also want to give an update uh, from an interesting uh, study that was uh, published yesterday in the uh, Morbidity and Mortality World uh, Report. So this regards the uh, outbreak that occurred on the USS Roosevelt, uh, the aircraft carrier. 
Uh, and this was a severe uh, outbreak that occurred Obviously, uh, on ship, uh, it's a very dense uh, population. People are sharing bunks. Uh, social distancing is extremely uh, uh, challenging. Uh, there are 4,000 crew members on board, and uh, about 1,000 of them ultimately uh, had a positive test for the virus or antibodies to the virus. And so they, uh, after they were uh, disembarked, uh, a group of about uh, 1,400 of the crew uh, were evacuated to a single site in Guam, and uh, 382 of them were recruited uh, for study. This included 238 who were infected and 144 who were not. 20% of those uh, with infection had no symptoms uh, throughout their course. 48% uh, of them uh, with infection, who had infections sought medical care. So roughly half never had to see a doctor uh, and 20% of them never had any symptoms whatsoever. It's important to point out that uh, this is a typically uh, young to uh, middle-aged uh, population, uh, typically healthy without a lot of underlying uh, medical problems. And this is an important uh, group to study because, uh, uh, because they do not come to medical attention, we have not had much insight into what the usual course of uh, a, a healthy infected uh, population might look like. So the symptoms that uh, significantly increased in the infected uh, crew uh, was loss of taste or smell actually occurred in about half of these patients. About half suffered myalgias, 40% had fevers, about 35% had chills. Uh, and uh, among uh, these, this group, cough or shortness of breath or difficulty breathing occurred in 41%. And this was uh, highly statistically significantly different than the uh, uninfected group. Uh, and uh, uh, of patients who had two or more of fever, chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, loss of taste or smell, uh, that accounted for about 28% of the infected group and uh, did not occur frequently in the uninfected group. So these constellations of symptoms uh, uh, had some ability to, to discriminate between those who were and were not infected. Uh, what I found uh, particularly interesting in uh, this study was that uh, they questioned people about their behaviors uh, and found uh, uh, that uh, those that significantly reduced risk of infection was wearing face covering, avoiding uh, common areas where everybody was congregating, and increasing uh, their distancing uh, to the extent possible on board. Uh, and the odds ratio, uh, the odds of uh, uh, getting uh, the, uh, of remaining free of infection, of getting the infection uh, divided, the odds of getting infected uh, were reduced uh, by nearly 70% by uh, uh, wearing a face covering and by about half avoiding common areas or increasing distancing. I think this is important uh, uh, data uh, in its ability to uh, uh, provide reassurance that uh, these uh, uh, goals are, are actually having an impact on uh, reducing the incidence of infection uh, in a high risk uh, uh, environment such as uh, on board uh, this ship. So that's as much as I wanted to say uh, this afternoon about uh, what's happening in the pandemic. I think uh, it's very encouraging what's uh, been happening in New York City and across the state and the region in general. Uh, but it is clear that that is not being experienced uh, equally across the United States. Uh, and I think we are suffering significantly from having uh, uh, a lack of national policy that is being broadly followed uh, and encouraged. So now it's my pleasure to turn to introducing Paul Benash, who heads the university's laboratory of retrovirology as an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Educated in England, Paul came to the United States in 1996 to conduct postdoctoral research at Duke University. Three years later, he moved to New York to join the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center, which was affiliated with Rockefeller at that time. Then as now, our city was deeply affected by a global pandemic. Although antiviral drugs have done much to bring HIV under control in prosperous nations, AIDS is still a critical problem in the developing world, causing more than 700,000 deaths globally in 2018. Paul has dedicated his career to reducing that alarming human toll. 
His work is revolutionizing HIV research and leading to new approaches to treatment and prevention. Paul has identified mechanisms by which HIV overcomes certain cellular defenses, revealing potential targets for therapeutic intervention. He and his partner, uh, Theodoro Hatsionu, created an altered form of HIV that has been used in animal models to accurately mirror the infection pro process in humans. Paul's team has since devised increasingly sophisticated techniques to manipulate viral genomes. We're for fortunate that Paul, Theodora, and other members of Paul's lab were able to draw upon their innovative HIV research when they joined the worldwide effort to confront COVID-19. Paul is collaborating with other Rockefeller investigators working on COVID-19, including Charlie Rice, Michelle Nussenzweig, and Marina Kasky, all of whom have prevented, pre presented previous COVID-19 webinars. With these colleagues, Paul recently reported on research using several types of engineered viruses to assess the neutralizing ability of antibodies against these novel corona, the novel coronavirus. As we'll hear today, these lab-created tools are the basis of rapid, simple tests that are now being used to study plasma samples from patients who have recovered from COVID-19. In collaboration with the New York Blood Center and other institutions, Paul and Theodora are making it possible to markedly increase the effectiveness of convalescent plasma to treat and prevent SARS-CoV-19 infections. The research also has the potential to accelerate progress in developing monoclonal antibody therapies, as well as vaccines. Paul is a recipient of the Elizabeth Glazer Award for Pediatric AIDS Research, the Eli Lilly Award, and the Kite KT Jang Retrovi Retrovirology Prize. He's a remarkable scientist whose work is more relevant than ever today. And now it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Paul. Well, thank you very much, Rick, for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, as Rick says, I'm a, a virologist and I've been at or associated with Rockefeller for the, the past 20 years. Um, obviously, as a virologist, one's life has changed quite dramatically quite recently. And uh, so it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about the work that we have been doing over the last uh, two or three months. And so, um, as Rick mentioned, uh, a lot of my work historically has been on studying how hosts defend themselves against viruses. And a large focus of our work is depicted on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, in particular, we study the, the mechanisms by which hosts defend themselves against viruses. And you can conceptually divide the host defense mechanisms into two. Uh, one group that we refer to as intrinsic or innate immunity are defenses that one is born with that don't change over your life, lifespan um, and these are mechanisms, proteins that uh, our cells make that uh, interfere with various steps in virus replication. And we've been studying these individual mechanisms for many years. For example, we have found uh, proteins that uh, stay on the outside of cells and trap viruses as they are attempting to bud off and leave to infect new cells. We found other proteins that interfere with HIV import into the nucleus of new target cells and various other types of host defenses. Now the advantage of these host defenses are that they can be mobilized within a few hours of infection. Some of them are even on all the time, even before one sees a virus. Their disadvantage is that they tend to be quite generic and not quite as potent as the other forms of defense that, about which we're going to talk this afternoon. Those other types of defense we call adaptive immunity. These are um, immune mechanisms that are contributed simplistically by cells that we call T cells and B cells, lymphocytes that circulate through the blood and throughout the body. And we're going to focus on B cells today. Um, what B cells are important for is for making antibodies. So let's begin with a, a primer about uh, B cells and antibodies. We have 
billions of different B cells uh, circulating throughout our body and each one has a slightly different receptor on its surface. And so when we become infected uh, by a virus, um, a subset of those B cells will recognize that virus and the recognition of the viral protein by that B cell sends a signal to that B cell to grow and divide, grow and divide, keep growing and dividing for a little while, and then make a form of these cell surface molecules that is released, and those are what we call antibodies. Those antibodies have the ability to recognize viral proteins, stick to those viral proteins, and some of those viral proteins are on the outside of the virus and are required for virus infection. And so those antibodies can directly interfere with viral infection, and that's what we call neutralization. There's another way in which antibodies work, that is to recognize virus-infected cells and basically act as a flag for other components of the immune system to come and kill and or eat those uh, virus-infected cells. And so this forms a crucial component of host defense against viruses. Once one has experienced infection by such a virus, one has B cells that are primed and circulating antibodies that can be mobilized instantly to defeat um, that virus. And when we think about vaccination, effectively what we're doing is training our immune systems to do this in advance. And so a vaccine will consist of either a weakened virus or a component of the virus that triggers B cells to grow and divide, grow and divide, make antibodies, be pre-mobilized against uh, those viral proteins. So when a new virus comes along, um, then we are ready, our immune systems are ready to tackle it. So over the last few months, we have experienced a new virus in the human population, SARS-CoV-2. Um, here are a couple of pictures, uh, pictures, real pictures of SARS-CoV-2, and then a schematic uh, diagram of the virus with just two of the proteins highlighted because these are the two major proteins against which antibodies are made during natural infection. So the nuclear capsid, there are many, many copies of this protein on the inside of the virus. And so um, when cells burst or the nucleocapsid protein leaks into the circulation, it's recognized by B cells. We make antibodies to nucleocapsid. Those antibodies are useful for diagnosing infection, but they're not very useful for protecting us against reinfection. They're not, it's not a protein that's on the outside of the virus. Um, to which antibodies combine and interfere with infection. What's much more important in terms of antibody-mediated um, protection from infection is this protein on the outside of the virus. It's called spike, or S. Uh, this is a close-up look of what the spike looks like. This is a, a structure. So if you look at it end-on, it's sort of a triangular shape. There are three identical subunits. Um, it gets its name really from the side view where it actually looks like a spike. The key important parts of the protein in terms of antibody defense are, is this so-called receptor binding domain, which I've highlighted in blue here. And what happens is this receptor binding domain component of the spike recognizes the ACE2 receptor on target cells, and that is the initiating step in infection by SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so what neutralizing antibodies do in effect is to interfere with this recognition event between the SARS-CoV-2 spike and or subsequent events, interactions between the spike protein and the target cell that allow the virus to enter and infect cells. Okay, so when uh, SARS-CoV-2 began to spread around the world, it became obvious to us and obvious to many people that antibodies were going to be a key component of how we eventually get through this pandemic um, and, and defeat this virus. Whether that's through herd immunity, through vaccination, 
or through actually using the antibodies themselves as a protection against uh, infection or a treatment, antibodies were going to be a crucial part of our uh, response, uh, our fight against this virus. And so drawing on uh, tools, skills that we've amassed over years studying retroviruses, uh, what we thought would be a very good use of our time would be to develop rapid, accurate, high throughput, convenient tests to measure neutralizing antibodies, the functional antibodies that can actually inhibit uh, infection by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so one can do this using the actual virus itself, using SARS-CoV-2, but in order to do that, uh, one needs a, a biosafety level three laboratory, um, actually handling the virus itself and doing the experiments to measure neutralizing antibodies against the bona fide virus are cumbersome uh, and really not amenable to high throughput. However, we know some tricks about how to measure such antibodies using viruses that we've been working with for years. And so what we did was to take a virus that we know very well, HIV-1, and start um, messing around with it. And so what we do is we take the genetic material of HIV-1. The first thing we do is to delete its envelope gene. The envelope gene is the gene that uh, encodes the proteins on the outside of the virus that HIV uses uh, to uh, attach to and enter cells. So by deleting that, we can now make virus particles that don't have any envelope protein on their surface. The second thing we did was to uh, insert into this modified HIV genome a gene for a protein that encodes an enzyme. It's an enzyme whose activity we can measure very quickly, very accurately, and has a, an enormous dynamic range so we can very accurately measure infection. And so what we simply do is to introduce into cells the DNA that allows the production of these bald viral particles that contain within them the gene for this easily to measure enzyme. And then at the same time, we introduce into those cells DNA that encodes the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And so what happens is that we, in, in fact, make what we call pseudoviruses or fake viruses. These are viruses that look like SARS-CoV-2 on the outside, but on the inside, they have an HIV genome encoding this easy to measure enzyme. Then what we do is simply apply those virus particles to cells that express the ACE2 receptor. Uh, we take a few thousand cells and a few thousand virus particles put each in the wells of a, a micro titer plate, um, leave them for a couple of days, and then we simply measure the activity of that enzyme, and that reflects how many cells were infected by a given number of virus particles. And so we can easily adapt that measurement to measure neutralizing antibodies by simply mixing these hybrid virus particles with antibodies or serum or plasma we can measure the ability of that plasma to block infection, i.e. reduction of that enzyme activity. So here's a real example. So uh, what's measured on the y-axis here is the amount of infection as measured by the levels of the enzyme that's encoded in the viral genome. And then as we go from left to right, we're adding increasing concentrations of plasma from normals, that is people who have not been infected by SARS-CoV-2, or from patients that have been infected with SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 plasma. And so as you decrease the dilution or increase the concentration, the amount of infection can be decreased up to 500 or more fold by uh, the antibodies that are present in that plasma. So, we have now measured neutralizing activity in the plasma of hundreds of people that have been infected by SARS-CoV-2. We're up to around 350 New Yorkers. And this, is, this graph shows on the y-axis how much neutralizing activity is in that plasma. And on the x-axis, the patients are simply arranged from left to right in ascending order of um, 
neutralizing activity. And what I'd like you to notice are two things, two things that are actually could be quite important for going forward. First, around 20% of people who we measure for neutralizing activity uh, are undetectable. There is no detectable neutralizing activity in their plasma. That's concerning. Um, we know that this is not simply an artifact of the way that we're measuring a neutralizing activity. Um, other groups using the authentic SARS-CoV-2 virus have, with smaller numbers of patients, arrived at similar 15 to 20 percent of patients who have documented SARS-CoV-2 infection do not appear to mount a detectable neutralizing response. At the other end of the spectrum, there are about 10% of people that we call, depending arbitrarily on how you, where you put your cutoff, elite neutralizers. People who have, you can dilute their plasma thousands of fold and yet still detect um, antibodies that uh, can neutralize the virus. And then there's every level of neutralizing activity in between. Obviously, is if one is designing a convalescent plasma treatment program, one would like to enrich for uh, these types of uh, plasmas. And in thinking about what might constitute convalescent immunity, uh, one would like to be able to, going forward, correlate levels of antibodies in the population as a whole uh, versus their uh, resistance to, to reinfection. Okay, so... Before going on, just a couple of little interesting um, tidbits that we found uh, when measuring these uh, neutralizing antibody levels. So on the left here, um, we're comparing levels of neutralizing antibodies in males uh, and females. And interestingly enough, we find that males have a little bit higher, about two-fold higher levels of neutralizing antibody uh, as compared to females. The reasons underlying that are, could be interesting and could be complex. I won't go into them now, but if you're so inclined, you can ask me during the Q&A session. On the right, uh, we have uh, taken a small group of patients who are very severely ill. These are people who were on ventilators or on oxygen um, and had, were really in, in quite serious uh, trouble with SARS-CoV-2 infection and compared their antibody levels to people who had a mild infection. Um, and what we find is the severe infections have about fivefold on average um, higher levels of antibody to the mild infections. I would point out, of course, there's still a great deal of overlap between these two populations. We certainly cannot explain all or even a major part of this variation in neutralizing titer based on criteria such as maleness or femaleness, severe or mild infection. But they are two of the criteria that contribute to this uh, dramatic variation in the levels of neutralizing antibody that we find uh, in individuals. Um, so, we can measure neutralizing antibody activity in hundreds of people. And if we did nothing else, we could probably measure neutralizing activity in thousands of people. Uh, I'm talking just about my lab here. But we will never be able to measure neutralizing activity in millions of people. And of course, there are millions of people that have been infected. So one uh, question that we approached with collaborators at New York Blood Center is, are any of the serological tests that can be applied to millions of people, can they be used usefully to predict neutralizing antibody levels and by inference predict uh, resistance to infection or identify people who might be the best donors for things like convalescent plasma therapy? And so when thinking about the serological tests that are applied, these are the three general uh, categories of serological tests that are in common use. The sort of the point of care lateral flow tests where you take a small volume of blood, put it into this little hole, and then you get a banding pattern if you're positive 
or negative for antibodies. This is not a quantitative test. It basically gives you a yes or no answer. So not especially useful for identifying people with the highest levels of neutralizing antibodies. There are two quantitative tests that are in common use. ELISA assays effectively use these plastic plates with little wells in. You put some viral protein into those wells and then by using patient plasma, you can then uh, measure how much antibody sticks to each of those wells uh, and get a readout for antibody levels. Um, a similar principle, but really um, implemented on a much higher throughput scale are these high throughput uh, serological assays. As I say, they work on similar principles to ELISA's, but they're effectively done by uh, robots in boxes and they grind through hundreds, thousands, sometimes even thousands of samples every hour of every day and by using these types of approaches you can get up to the very high numbers of people that have been infected to, to judge um, uh, convalescent uh, antibody levels. So just a brief uh, um, interlude to tell you how these uh, platforms before, perform. So these lateral flow assays, they do work. Um, they are of variable quality. Uh, this is a panel of 141 uh, documented infections that were assayed by this a group of these tests at the New York Blood Center. And they give uh, about 80% positive uh, signal in, in those in convalescent donors. These are two commercial high throughput serological assays from these two companies. I have no affiliation with either of them. So anything I say is just a purely a research question. I'm not benefiting in any way from what I'm saying today. Um, they do quite well to identify um, people who are positive scoring in the uh, sort of low to mid nineties in correctly identifying people who, uh, who have uh, been infected. Now, the interesting thing about these tests is not only do you get a positive or a negative, but you get a number, a, a level of antibodies. And so what we tried to do was to try and correlate the numbers that come from these high throughput serological tests with the levels of neutralizing antibodies. And here you can see for both of these uh, commercial tests, they do a pretty good job of discriminating people who have high versus low neutralizing antibodies um, based on the score that you get on those tests. They're clearly not perfect, but for example, if you score above 200 on this test, you can be fairly confident that you have a decent level of neutralizing uh, antibody. Similarly on this test, score above six or eight, again, fairly confident that you have uh, uh, decent levels of neutralizing antibodies. Now what's quite interesting is that the, the actual antigen that's used in these tests um, has some effect on the ability of that test to predict whether you have neutralizing activity, but whether you use the spike protein as the antigen, the, the uh, coating for the, uh, uh, in this case, ELISA test, or the nucleocapsid protein in this test here, uh, both tests correlate with neutralizing activity. So the higher you score on a, on a nuclear capsule ELISA increases the chance that you have decent neutralizing activity. Now, of course, that cannot be a cause and effect relationship. Antibodies to the nuclear capsid protein can't be neutralizing because that protein's on the interior of the virus. Instead, they sort of provide a surrogate measure of antibody-based immunity um, that would actually be mediated by antibodies to the spike protein. So that has one biological implication and leads us to think that perhaps these different levels of antibodies reflect uh, perhaps different levels at which the immune system has been stimulated perhaps as a result of different amounts of virus replication or exposure of the um, immune system to different amounts of virus. And that would comport um, with, for, what a, for example, with what I showed you a couple of slides ago, people who have had more severe infection 
uh, also have higher levels of antibodies, leading to the hypothesis that perhaps um, the more virus that your immune system has been exposed to, the higher levels of antibodies and the higher levels of those functional neutralizing antibodies um, may have been elicited. Okay, so that um, documents some of our studies on um, antibodies that are present in plasma. In the last couple of minutes, I'd just like to update you on a project that uh, we've also uh, been involved with, and it's also to do uh, with antibodies. So as I have mentioned, um, some of the antibodies that are made in response to a viral infection are, are neutralizing. Um, some of them recognize irrelevant viral proteins and are useful diagnostically, but provide no protection. Even antibodies that uh, uh, recognize the spike protein, some of those are very potent neutralizing antibodies, and some really don't do anything um, to uh, control uh, uh, virus replication. And so what one goal of a project that we've been involved with at Rockefeller is to identify the really potent neutralizing antibodies um, that are present in convalescent individuals, clone the genes for them, and then manufacture those antibodies potentially as a treatment um, or as a, a prophylaxis. And this is really made possible by the work of my colleague, Michel Nussenswege and his team who over the, the past few years have developed incredible methods for uh, cloning antibodies um, from humans. And really the way they do that is to take part of the virus, they fluorescently label it and then incubate it with B cells and then clone individual B cells, clone the antibody genes from those individual B cells, then make those antibodies and then we get involved and we'd start testing whether those antibodies uh, have a neutralizing activity. And so this is uh, one such experiment where dozens of individual B cells were put into individual wells, the antibody genes cloned from those uh, individual B cells. And what you can see in this experiment is level of infection, again measured using that uh, enzyme assay that I told you about earlier. And as you go from left to right, we're increasing the amount of these individual antibodies. And each line here represents an individual cloned antibody. And so with Michelle's group cloning these antibodies, we've gone through dozens, even hundreds of these antibodies. And what you can see is that an irrelevant antibody has no effect on infection. Um, some of these antibodies have some effect on infection and some of them, uh, three that we're particularly interested, highlighted by the colored lines, are really quite potent at inhibiting um, uh, infection. And so these are, the, are three of the antibodies that, uh, in which we are most interested and on the left, you can see, again, increasing antibody concentration from left to right, inhibiting infection of the pseudovirus that we have made, the HIV on the inside, SARS-CoV-2 on the outside, and then against the bona fide SARS-CoV-2 on the right-hand side. And you can see that even at concentrations as low as 1 to 10 nanograms per mil, we can inhibit half the infection. This is a measure that we, we use the so-called IC50 of these antibodies in terms of inhibiting SARS-CoV-2 infection is in the 1 to 10 nanogram, that's billionths of a gram per milliliter range. For the aficionados among you, that's picomolar um, potency, which is really very good and in fact good enough, uh, more than good enough for these antibodies to go forward into clinical development as they are doing, and hopefully those will begin to be administered to patients in phase one clinical trials later this summer. So one, before I finish, one thing I'd like to just highlight from these studies that turns out to be quite interesting and actually quite hopeful. Um, you know, in some respects, one could be quite disappointed in seeing a curve like this where many, many people make low or 
even no detectable levels of neutralizing antibodies, with really only a few being the elite or, or really potent neutralizers. But what Michel and his group found is when we were cloning all these antibodies and looking for their potency in terms of neutralization, we could find potent, potent neutralizing antibodies as one would expect from these elite neutralizers, but also even these um, what we would call unexceptional neutralizers, they also made potent neutralizing antibodies. It's just that they did not make very much of them. So that, again, reinforces a, a potential view yet, yet to be demonstrated, but I think um, will ultimately turn out to be true, is that most people can make a potent neutralizing response to SARS-CoV-2. It's just that many people's immune systems have not been sufficiently stimulated uh, in order to do so. And that, I think, um, raises, raises my hopes, at least, in terms of our ability to um, come up with a successful vaccine. If one can just get enough exposure of the immune system to the right viral protein, it looks as if most and perhaps all people will be able to make these potently neutralizing antibodies that will protect them against a subsequent infection. Okay, let me summarize uh, briefly what I've told you. First, the levels of neutralizing antibodies are highly variable in people who have had COVID-19 disease or SARS-CoV-2 infections. Um, severe cases, males have higher levels of neutralizing antibodies somewhat than their um, opposites in um, following infection. Um, the high throughput serological assays that can grind through millions of uh, samples are actually not too bad at predicting uh, neutralizing activity. And um, that's of obvious importance in thinking about how we might deploy convalescent plasma and or predict uh, immunity going forward. Um, and perhaps most importantly, most people appear to be capable of generating uh, potent neutralizing antibodies, even if many, many of us don't uh, in response to the initial uh, uh, encounter with the virus. Now, obviously, there are some key questions remaining. And top of this list, the $64,000 question is, what levels of SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies do we actually need to make to be protective? It might be that these low levels of antibodies might be protective. They might be temporarily protective. Um, we just don't know at this point. Uh, that's a crucial question to answer because it has obvious implications for convalescent immunity, um, obvious implications for convalescent plasma and monoclonal antibody prophylaxis and therapy. And of course, as vaccine trials begin, we sort of need to know what we're looking for in terms of a target level of, of immunity uh, in order to predict might, what might constitute an efficacious vaccine. A related question, how stable is immunity to SARS-CoV-2? If we go back to the same 350 uh, patients in three months, six months, what will the levels of neutralizing activity be then? Um, obviously, uh, crucial questions to answer. I've hinted at and actually think the answer to this question might be yes. Can vaccines in fact elicit better immunity to SARS-CoV-2 uh, than, than natural infection? The existence of those potent neutralizing antibodies, even in people who actually haven't made many of them, inspires some confidence in that regard. And as far as what we are working on, uh, we have an eye to the future, and that is, will SARS-CoV-2 develop resistance to antibodies? Obviously, that's important in the context of antibody therapy, but also in the context of vaccines. And what I can tell you thus far is we have developed systems where we can drive resistance to antibodies in the laboratory. We know where to look in the viral protein for mutation, viral proteins to, for mutations uh, that can confer resistance to antibodies. And now we're beginning to look in sequence databases 
to see whether those mutations that confer antibody resistance are beginning to arise. Um, additionally, this sort of work will help us optimize combinations of antibodies um, in therapy. Okay, so let me close by just acknowledging just a few of the people that have been involved uh, in this work. So um, as Rick mentioned, my um, scientific partner, who also happens to be my wife, uh, Theodora Hatsioanu, uh, we do just about everything together uh, at work uh, and at home. Um, the work that I have told you about, uh, the work at Rockefeller in particular, has involved a, a wonderful team of, of collaborators. Uh, Michelle Nussenzweig and his team uh, have done all, all the antibody cloning and identification of those potent neutralizing antibodies. His colleagues in the laboratory and in the clinic, Davide Robbiani and Marina Kasky, obviously crucial for this work. And uh, Charlie Rice, and his group have been involved in this as well, in particular using the real virus to um, make sure that we are actually identifying antibodies that do, do what we hope they will do. Um, I'd also mentioned Larry Lushinger at the New York Blood Center. Um, we've been working closely with Larry to measure convalescent immunity in their uh, convalescent plasma donor pool, and they contributed many of the samples uh, and measurements that I talked about today. Uh, James Sabetta at Greenwich Hospital is a, an enterprising clinician with whom we have uh, had discussions and who provided the samples for the, um, um, the severe cases that, that I talked about. Um, many, many, many people in various groups have been involved in this work. I'd just like to highlight the, the group in my lab, uh, Yiska, Frauke and Fabian, um, who have really worked around the clock, absolutely, literally around the clock for the last uh, three months uh, tackling this virus. Uh, Magda has been helping them um, uh, more recently, but no less uh, essentially. And um, I just make one, one point in response to uh, uh, some news items that have occurred recently. Um, all of these people here are on temporary visas, J and H visas, and we're obviously quite distressed at uh, discussions we're hearing about suspension of those visa programs. Um, none of the work um, that I have described to you today would have been possible um, without these extremely hardworking, dedicated individuals. Thank you very much, Paul. That was a wonderful presentation. We have uh, many questions and uh, we should just jump right in and get through uh, as many as we possibly can. Uh, you've addressed uh, many of them. One of the questions that uh, has come in regards uh, the, infect the infectious root of the virus. There's been a lot of discussion about uh, aerosols versus droplets versus touch on surface. Uh, as a virologist, uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts about uh, the relative contributions of these sources? So that has been a topic of some debate. Um, you know, we, we, each individual case that, that shows up, it's quite rare that one can identify exactly where that person acquired their infection. Um, the best guesses are that most, most infection is through um, respiratory droplets, fairly large particles of um, saliva um, that, that are excreted when we talk, um, even more so when we sing, uh, when we cough and sneeze. Um, but I think it's also worth bearing in mind that if one actually measures the amount of virus in the saliva of individuals, it can vary over a 10,000 fold range. And obviously, the higher that amount of virus, the smaller the volume of secretion one would need to be exposed to to encounter an infectious, uh, infectious virus. And so this so-called phenomenon of super spreaders is almost certainly real. They're very likely a subset of individuals who are very much more infectious than most. And in those cases, I, I ha have quite little doubt that aerosol transmission plays, plays a role. Now, what the, 
the numbers are in terms of what fraction are aerosol, respiratory droplet, and contact fomites, door handles, that sort of thing. Um, that is really, I think, anybody's guess at this moment. I think we'll, we may be able to get at that question uh, retrospectively, um, but I would be a fool to put a number on those um, routes at this point. Great. There have been a number of questions uh, about uh, uh, reinfection risk and uh, as well the relationship to uh, are asymptomatic uh, individuals who have been infected more, li more likely to be reinfected or less likely to be infected and uh, how risky are they in the transmission chain? Yeah, great question. And that, that is part of the $64,000 question that I posed on the, on the uh, penultimate slide. Now, uh, I should say that uh, my presentation focused in virtually entirely on neutralizing antibodies. Um, that's only part of our immune system. We also have another arm, T cells, that also like to contribute uh, to defense. So the, the absence of neutralizing antibodies does not in itself guarantee susceptibility to reinfection. It could be that those people's, people are in fact resistant to infection. We sort of have to weigh our inability to detect neutralizing antibodies against the empirical observation that those people actually did recover and clear the virus. Um, so whether their innate immune systems or T cell based immunity was responsible for that clearance, and they are indeed protected, um, remains to be seen. Um, we're simply going to have to wait to see what happens when those people re-encounter the virus uh, as, as in, during a second wave that may or may not occur um, to really understand that. We do know from work on um, other coronaviruses, so the the five coronaviruses that um, circulate through human populations around the world, that the levels of neutralizing antibodies are a very good correlate of whether people get reinfected. We know that with those coronaviruses, reinfection is common, typically not shortly after an initial infection, but months or years later, people certainly can get reinfected and they are more likely to be reinfected if neutralizing antibodies are low. So um, it's, I think it's quite likely that reinfections will occur. What the consequences of those reinfections will be, I don't know at this point. Thanks. So um, in the reports about viral infections, and in fact, in some published papers, um, there's a loose correlation or relationship uh, between measuring viral RNA and measuring infectious virus. For example, many people who have been infected will continue to be positive for RNA for out to, I've seen reports out to two months uh, uh, after uh, becoming asymptomatic. Uh, should those people be considered to be at risk of transmitting a virus or is it only the viral particles that we ought to be paying attention to? So again, another difficult uh, one that you get a bunch of virologists in a room and they could argue for hours uh, about this. So it's clear that uh, a fragment of RNA that you can measure in a test, uh, a PCR test, that by itself is not an infectious particle. And it's also true that uh, once someone's been infected and there's been a lot of lung damage, a lot of virus in that person, there's going to be a period where there's likely to be high levels of non-infectious um, but RNA positive material that continues to be coughed up uh, and, and secreted. Um, but in, so it's, it's very likely that that sort of tail end where people are PCR positive, but you can't isolate virus, very likely that most of those people are non-infectious. However, once you get out months after infection and you're still continuing to detect RNA, then one has to consider the possibility that there are small numbers of infected cells that are continuing to produce RNA um, at some, some low level. And I have heard 
anecdotes, and that, of course they are anecdotes and so should be treated with skepticism. Um, patients that um, showed up to, uh, were in, in a hospital ward um, in a neighboring bed with somebody who had been PCR negative, then became low PCR positive, and then the other person in the room became PCR positive, okay? Inferring that that person actually did infect their, um, their roommate, as it were. So what to make of this at this point is, is very unclear. I think it, it is very clear that if people who are a long way out from symptoms, who just have very low levels of RNA, the, the risk to the general population from those people is extremely low. It may not be zero, but it's extremely low. Thank you. So can you speak to the research showing a connection between blood type and greater or lesser susceptibility to infection or outcome? Yes. Um, again, interesting. Um, so it appears that um, people who have a, a, of blood group A are more likely to be infected and are more likely to have severe disease, whereas blood group O are less like to be in, likely to be infected and, and have severe disease. Underlying mechanisms are not worked out. Um, there are a few possibilities. It might be that it's, it's uh, simply a red herring uh, and there's an confo underlying confounding variable um, that co-varies with blood group. Um, a linked gene, for example, or um, some other demographic characteristic that varies with blood group. There is, what, there is a plausible mechanism, though, that could directly implicate um, blood group antigens. So blood group antigens are sugar molecules that get attached uh, to proteins. And when you're of a different blood group, if you're um, A, for example, you have antibodies to particular sets of sugar molecules that are different to the antibodies than if you're an O blood group. And it's also true that the cells in which SARS-CoV-2 replicates, they do at times express the proteins that make blood group antigens. So it's possible that some of us have more or less antibodies to those sugar molecules that might be on the virus. And that in principle could contribute um, to protection or disease. But at present, that's, that's, that's kind, I'm kind of hand-waving at the moment. That's largely speculative. But the phenomenon seems to be real. A couple of different studies have documented it now. So one of the uh, $64 billion questions uh, on the docket is, uh, how should we be thinking about infection in children and uh, their risk for spreading infection and how that impacts what we're going to do in September when uh, kids are supposed to be heading back to school? Yes, so that one strikes quite close to home. I have two preteens in my house and I have one or two risk factors for severe disease. So um, the bottom line is at this point, I don't know. So it's pretty clear that children can be infected and can pass the virus on. Um, there are some studies showing that the amount of virus in children is equal to that uh, in adult, adults, uh, leading one to think that they are, would be just as infectious, even if they tend not to get sick themselves. Uh, I say tend not to get sick, but it's clear that disease is not absent from children, it's just, it's just very much rarer. Um, I think we should be approaching this very cautiously. Um, with the same philosophy that we're taking to reopening other aspects of life in, in New York City, um, a little bit at a time, um, with as much testing as possible, and with the clear knowledge that if, if infections do begin to ramp up, uh, then we should be, should be able to, to pull back. A reasonable starting point that I have heard discussed, for example, would be to have small numbers of children uh, in each classroom, um, but maintaining a, a rigorous um, online curriculum as we have been doing with our children for the last few months. 
Thank you. So um, you talked about uh, using monoclonal antibodies as therapeutics. A couple of questions have come in there. One is, do you think IgG will prevent uh, the kind of upper respiratory mucosal infection that uh, many of these are thought to start with? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, IgG does get to mucosal surfaces. We do. We think of IgA as being the mucosal antibody, but it's also true that there, there, are, there are good levels of, of IgG in, in mucus. And do uh, you have concerns about uh, whether the antibodies themselves, uh, perhaps depending upon the source, uh, might have uh, deleterious effects and not just uh, effects that would neutralize the virus? Right, so that is something that has been thought about. Um, uh, more in the situation with convalescent um, plasma therapy than, than with the, the monoclonal antibodies. With the monoclonal antibodies, one can, one can play around with uh, the antibody itself and engineer in or out interactions with cells of the immune system that, that could, in principle, elicit these um, more dangerous uh, inflammatory process, processes. Um, Again, not based on very much data, but my, my, my thought is that if the antibodies really get on top and knock down the levels of virus replication to, to, to very low levels, then that will obviously be a good thing. Where things might get dangerous is if you have high levels of virus replication and, and a, a sub-neutralizing level of antibodies that could, in principle, exacerbate the inflammatory process that is thought to to underlie the, the pathology. So we, you know, the way things are moving forward with the antibodies, there, there is half an eye on engineering the antibodies to avoid the inflammatory um, processes, but one also has to bear in mind that those interactions of antibodies are also an important part of why they're protective. So um, I think we're going to have to wait for clinical trials, but Thus far, thus far, at least with the convalescent plasma therapy trials, it doesn't seem to be that giving extra antibodies seems to exacerbate disease at this point. So the antibodies that come out of humans have somewhat been pre-screened uh, for not having effects that uh, would be obviously adverse. How about antibodies that haven't uh, been through humans as part of their uh, life history? Uh, specifically think about antibodies raised in other species? Interesting. Um, so most of those antibodies, as I understand it, are essentially transplanting the human genes for antibodies into those species and then immunizing those animals with, with SARS-CoV-2 antigens. One might have a little bit of an extra safety concern there, but in general, if they're administered as monoclonal antibodies, they can be engineered to to mimic mimic the human antibodies. Um, if they're given as, for example, um, plasma from a, a large animal that that has a, a human antibody repertoire, one might have to proceed a little more cautiously in clinical trials in that instance. And then last question, um, what are your thoughts on uh, the prospects for vaccines being developed uh, quickly uh, by the end of the year in quantity and uh, safety testing? There's so many questions swirling around uh, about the feasibility of uh, progress uh, on the timescale that people are hoping for. Yes, so that, yeah, you didn't pick the easy questions, did you? <laughs> Um, so, so at this point, we really don't know what what's 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 happening. Um, as I sort of hinted at through the presentation, I don't think it's going to be very difficult to develop a vaccine against this virus. I think it's likely to be possible to elicit pretty decent levels of of neutralizing antibodies. Whether any of the approaches that are first out of the gate, the RNA from Moderna, the um, 
chimpanzee adenovirus, um, whether those will be the ones that elicit sufficient levels of protective antibodies, um, um, I don't know. It might be that those, those vaccines uh, are good enough to begin with, um, and then later we develop vaccines that perhaps give lifelong protection. Um, I think we just have to wait and see for the see with the with the clinical trials. And I think actually that NIH and the um, uh, research councils uh, in the UK and around the world are actually doing a, a very good job of getting these vaccines into people in a timely but in a timely way, but with an eye to safety. Terrific. And with that, I think it's time for us to uh, close the discussion. I want to thank Paul for a wonderful overview of his work and the brilliant discussion. So as you've heard, he's made remarkable strides in a very short period of time. We still have a lot of work ahead of us and philanthropic support is vital to our progress. Please see the next slide for more information about how you can contribute and help us uh, combat the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to thank all of you for participating today. I, will hope, I hope you will join us for our next webinar on Thursday, July 9, when we're in for a real treat. Uh, renowned journalist and newscaster Paula Zahn uh, will join me on screen uh, to have a discussion about COVID-19, where we are now and where we're going. Until July 9, I hope you'll continue to visit our website for other COVID-19 research news and for recordings of our past sessions. All of us here at Rockefeller hope that you will stay safe and be healthy. Thank you very much for participating this afternoon and I wish you all a good evening.